Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. And today we are going to sift through the various possible meanings of hearing voices. So my first clinical experience of this phenomena of hearing voices came to me when I was in one of my internships and I was working in a psychiatric hospital. And hearing voices is apparently one of the most common signs Uh, and symptoms of people who are going into a psychotic state, and that the voices have a profound amount of independence. Um, They seem to come from a very different kind of personality structure inside of the person. They often give them commands. They're often relentless. Subsequent to that experience where the hearing voices is so problematic to the person and really interfering with their ability to feel safe often, as well as feeling grounded, over the years, I have had clients come in and confess that hearing voices is actually a normal part of how they experience themselves, how they solve problems, and how they move through the world of how they experience themselves or how they experience something other, something external coming into them. It seems to me that's a crucial difference. It is. What I find is that sometimes people will characterize the voices in a kind of spiritual or mediumistic paradigm, and they can often comfortably hold the phenomena of hearing voices as if they are outside beings or personalities that are communicating to them. And whether or not it's distressing often has to do with the content. I think that some people integrate it in a somewhat more psychological way, and they do, often through therapy, come to understand the voices as aspects of themselves that want to be heard, want to be acknowledged, and that can become a deeply meaningful part of how they negotiate their own interiority. So I feel like I want to give a little background that, of course, we all have sort of like inner voices, you know, like, you, you know, it's like, oh, you know, this, well, this inner speak voice. Speak for is... yourself, Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> it's, you know, but like some people, it's like you, you can, you can sort of figuratively, there's a, there's an inner voice that says like, oh my God, why did you do that? You're so stupid, right? You know, that's kind of like a typical okay. one. But it's not, it doesn't, you don't, you don't have any experience of it being something that you, that you hear, you know, like with your ears, it's just sort of a thought, right? So that's, that's one kind of internal voice. But some people, what you're talking about, Joseph, they, you know, when, when you hear a voice in a sort of an, an auditory hallucination, when that's happening, you know, apparently it's so real. And I've sat with people who were, who had this going on and, you know, that they'll look at me and they'll say, do you hear that? Like they're absolutely convinced that there are other people in the room talking, you know, and just background for listeners, for those who may not be in the mental health field, the kind of standard way of dealing with that in, you know, American psychiatric approach is that this is a symptom of psychosis and that you ought to sort of not pay it much mind, kind of redirect the person, and that the first line treatment for it would be would be medication, right? Some form of antipsychotic medication. Mm-hmm. And Joseph, would, would I, I'm sort of with you that this came up for me in my internship initially when I was training to be a psychotherapist. And it was really interesting because it did not fit what had been described to me. You know, the typical presentation of psychosis, according to what you learn in graduate school, is that it often happens in young adulthood, maybe when you first leave home, and that if that happens, and it turns out that it's schizophrenia, that the prognosis is very, very poor, and the person will probably need to take medication to control the symptoms. And that definitely happens. I'm not, I'm not saying that doesn't happen. But the first time that I met someone who was having an experience of hearing voices, 
it was very much in a spiritual context. This this person had a very strong spiritual belief, and he experienced his uh, kind of spiritual leader speaking to him. And, you know, it seemed to me that there was something adaptive about that. But lo and behold, he went to a psychiatrist and was put on antipsychotics. And I, you know, I was sort of horrified because yeah. I wasn't really sure that's what it fit. And then I've come across it in other, in other cases, too, where it just didn't fit the standard uh, paradigm. And, and I will say that there is a movement, an international movement. If I'm not mistaken, it's called the Hearing Voices Movement. And I believe there is a book and there are websites and there are self-help groups. They're not led by a professional, as I understand it. They're led by people who hear mm -hmm. voices, who have come to terms with hearing voices. And maybe mm -hmm. if we can find those resources, maybe we'll link them in the show notes. Well, well from a Jungian point of view, the psyche is dissociative. In, in other words, I often use the image of bubbles, that we are made up of lots of parts that all together make up a whole, but can be separate from one another. So I think what we're really raising up here is it always one thing, and it's always bad, and it always needs to be medicated, and that's the end of it. Or could there be more to this phenomenon that we can be curious about and that might have a different function from just uh, the pathologizing one of standard psychiatric diagnosis? Uh, I think that frames it really beautifully. Uh, now th that as Jungians, we are always looking towards the meaningfulness of psyche and yes. that at any given time, psyche is responding in the best possible way mm -hmm. to the various stressors and emerging impulses within it. And one of those ways can be through hearing voices. So Jung has this great quote that I'm probably going to butcher a little bit. It's something like, every symptom is a failed attempt at a cure. Mm. So every, it's sort of, yeah. So, so like the hearing voices would be the psyche's attempt to, to grow or to become more whole or to address some lack. Well, I'm thinking about two examples. One of them is of someone who is warned by a voice. And that happened to someone who was walking along and not paying attention and could have had a face, fatal accident and heard a voice behind him saying, stop, hmm. called his name and stop. And he, he turned and looked behind him and, and realized that he'd almost made a serious misstep because he hadn't really been paying enough attention to where he was out in the woods and his footing is, wasn't just a sidewalk. The other is the kind of voices that we read about where people are told to do just heinous things. Like the son of Sam. Yeah, and I have a hard time believing that there's, you know, some way that that's healing. Of course, you know, of what I don't know that I do. Yeah, and those are sort that. of two good points on a continuum, right? But I, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk in in a very um, disguised way about a client. I'm gonna change details and and speak very generally uh, so that I'm not betraying anyone's material. But I worked with a young man who started um, hearing voices, which is very typical. They were the voices were persecutory. Mm -hmm. So kind of had like a paranoid quality that, you know, you're, you're doing everything wrong or, you know, um, people are talking about you or everybody knows that you're really a failure or, you know, she, you know, he, he was interested in this young woman and, you know, she, she's laughing at you, that kind of thing. And of course it is kind of hard to see the telos or the growth or whatever in that, but we did begin to to work with these voices a little bit in, in that kind of, you know, being curious about what might be there, you know, what, what was important, what might be there kind of symbolically, what were they saying? And of course, you know, it's not, you know, this is not so sophisticated, but, but just this idea that, that these voices were giving voice to something that this young man really, really feared and, and also pointing out something that he really, really wanted. He wanted connection he wanted a relationship. And and a lot of the content of the voices was around this uh, young woman that he was interested in. So I think the approach th that you're suggesting is the same approach 
that we would take to a dream analysis, that the voice is a product of the unconscious, and that if we can engage it the way we would help a client engage their dream images, it is possible that something meaningful or something hidden in the personality is demanding attention. Mm -hmm. And the proof is in the pudding. If engaging the voices does in fact lead to some observable integrative process, then we know that's working. Yeah, if it's amenable to that, I think the other thing that comes up for me is that we're scared as therapists, analysts, family members, uh, etc. We're scared when someone says he or she is hearing things, especially if it's persecutory. Mm-hmm. And uh, so wh- whoever is hearing this kind of thing from a person, we have to figure ourselves into it in a way that's very different from someone who says, I had a dream of. Because there, there's a clear boundary between consciousness, and I know that this is unconscious material, whereas hearing voices fuzzes that boundary yeah. up, between, and it is scary to us. We have all had to uh, make a good separation between conscious and unconscious and keep them in their place. And, and this really does kind of break open that, that boundary. It is a, it's an unsettling experience to sit with someone who is hearing voices. Yes, and it's not clear what to do, and it is tempting to medicate the just medicate it away. And then we fall into the possibility that there is something important that can be understood that psyche is trying to communicate. And it goes back to Jung's experience when he was working in a psychiatric hospital uh, with seriously disturbed people. And Jung felt that if even uh, the most sort of chaotic verbal material could really be understood symbolically that it had meaning and we we risk forfeiting the meaning even when someone comes up with material that we find upsetting and of course you know that's a really great point and there there is a lot of fear i mean you know certainly anytime this is crossed my threshold it does create a certain amount of anxiety and and you know and it is worth saying that certainly there are times when absolutely the right thing to do is is medicate i mean i I would i wouldn't it would be cavalier to say oh well no we can just handle this psychoanalytically Mm -hmm. i mean perhaps sometimes we can i certainly want to stay open to that but i I wouldn't want to be uh rigid and and not take advantage of psychopharmaceutical treatment options either you know, what I'm thinking about in the case that I'm that I just shared a minute ago is in some sense the voices were were sort of a hallucinatory version of the persecutory thoughts that we all think. I mean, most of us can identify some pretty horrendously negative inner voices. And it was almost like these had just become, you know, more vivid for for this person, for this young man. And, and so some of the work that we did was around identifying uh, how these voices gave voice to these inner attitudes where he really devalued himself. And, you know, what you do when you find out that someone has an inner persecutory voice is you say, oh, well, that's really interesting. And you encourage them to become curious about that voice. And, you know, maybe where did that voice come from? I, th- I think we all have a tendency to develop those voices, but especially if a parent spoke to us like that, you know, we might say, okay, so does that sound like your mom's voice? And and that sort of thing. And then eventually what you want to do is kind of become more conscious of that voice, you know, as a, and again, I'm speaking of an inner voice, you want to become more conscious of it and be able to kind of uh, maybe speak back to it. Yeah, so I think what you're doing is beautifully is you're modeling the attitude towards the phenomena, towards the voices that you hope the client will adopt. So I think even though, as you said, sometimes the analyst might be very anxious Um, to encounter the phenomena, but the analyst's ability to stay deeply calm, to stay very centered, and to offer a way to relate to this phenomena of psyche. Because if the ego can stay very relaxed, if people can adopt that same attitude of curiosity and objectivity about it, not unlike mindfulness, Mm -hmm. which is very popular right now, 
And our, we think about mindfulness, I know it's a diatribe and, and Buddhist meditation. Buddhists have demonstrated a tremendous capacity to tolerate very intense physical and psychological phenomena through adopting that observing kind of position without being knocked off center. Yeah. So I find that for people who do well and actually may f even find inner voices enriching, that they have found a way to take a stance that's at the center and whether or not the voices are distressed or whether or not the voices are giving them good or bad advice, they don't lose track of the I-thou relationship to the voices, which allows them to make use of that and explore it in a lot of different ways. Well, that's the crucial distinction. It is. is that there are two positions in the psyche, mm -hmm. the I and the thou, mm -hmm. so that then it can be engaged and worked with as shadow material of tell me more about that part that says you think people are laughing at you or you think uh, you're not good enough or whatever it is. N now you do have a dialogue with an, a therapist or analyst and you have a dialogue between you and you as well. However, some people are not able to do that and literalize the voices that the voices are telling me to, you know, do something that is clearly against that person's interest or someone else's interest. Absolutely. And we don't want to trivialize severe mental illness, Absolutely which schizophrenia not. can be. But I want to say something. Coming to a place where you don't view those voices literally is not, we don't support adopting uh, a kind of symbolic attitude toward these voices in our culture. So the two possible things you can do are literalize them and take them, you know, take them literally or dismiss them, okay? And psychiatry says, we're just dismissing that. It doesn't matter. It's not important. We're going to make it go away with medication, right? If you take it literally, it's like, oh, well, the voices are telling me to kill myself, right? Or mm -hmm. to kill someone else. That, yeah. that can happen too. Or, or, or any number of other or things. Or some other tragic right? Uh, not directive. even tragic, but just maybe sometimes even bizarre, right? Yeah. The voices are telling me to rip my clothes off or whatever. And if you take it literally, or, or if you think even about the, the movie, A Beautiful Mind. Yeah, let's take, let's use a different word. Too. I think the word literally doesn't speak to it correctly. Okay. Because they are literal. Okay. So, I mean, what you're saying is whether or not the ego will surrender its autonomy and obey the instructions of the yes. voices it's an issue of maintaining its autonomy. Mm -hmm. So I think that's more of what we're saying. Well, except that I think that for people who are working with their voices, they know that they are voices. So the person sitting in my office saying, do you hear that? Mm -hmm. Thought there were other people, maybe just around the corner speaking, mm -hmm. and, and wasn't able in that moment to say, okay, you know, I'm having this experience, but I can recognize that it is a psychological experience. Right. So that's an important step that this is happening in my brain. This is happening in my psyche. And you're absolutely right. When I think about that in my hospital experience, people mixing, you know, the outer world with mm -hmm. this internal sensory phenomena exactly. is very frightening to them mm -hmm. and also very disorienting. Yes, very scary. So that's one task is can the ego discern the difference between an inner phenomena, which is fully sensory, and the outer world. Mm -hmm. And that, that's, a, that's an important distinction as to whether or not they're safe in this phenomena. I think the other distinction is um, with the person that I know uh, who related this to me many years ago and uh, not a client, what happened there? And there are many reported incidents of, of things like this. You mean the, the person who the heard person the voice saying stop? Yes. First name, mm -hmm. I'll say the first name was Bob. Bob, stop. Hmm. And loud and sharp. Now, I don't, you know, I don't, there's a little bit of mystery here mm -hmm. as to whether that is an entirely internal phenomenon. Well, but I think what mm -hmm. we're saying is that when somebody is hearing a voice, the only thing we know is that the auditory center of the brain is being stimulated. Yes. Mm -hmm. So that's a fact because okay. the auditory nerves are being stimulated and they can report that. The other issue is what are the various either parts of the brain or perhaps parts of the psyche, which is more mysterious, 
that can access the auditory mm-hmm. center. And here it almost sounds like some intuitive function, which was able to sense a larger picture in the environment, was able to actually reach in, stimulate the auditory in se- center, and create an important kind of attention-getting uh, device. Some people might have felt a sensation of dread or something like that in order to receive this signal from their intuition. I think in, uh, what I'm trying to point to is that in many ways, that boundary between what's internal and what is mm-hmm. external can get blurry, can be permeable. And that when we're working with someone who hears voices or has an incident of this, maybe our first mission here is to be curious. Sure. Yeah. Rather mm-hmm. than being too quick to medicate it away. Mm-hmm. Uh, but what's going on here? Right. We're, we're in very mysterious territory in the story that you've shared. Yes. You know, and, and, and there's a part of me that just wants to sort of honor that mystery. And mm-hmm. there are many, many a story of uh, religious inspiration mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. intervention mm-hmm. that we honor now as experiences that were prophetic or of divine intervention or of angels, etc., that are in canon in various traditions mm-hmm. that came are purported to have come from uh, yes. the external, from the divine. So we're we're not so sure exactly what's going on right at the outset. If I would leave with just one parting note, uh, I've had a lot of experience in this realm, actually, is if we as analysts can contain our anxiety, if we can feel assured in our own strength to hold the intensity of the experience, and that we can model that for clients, I think that we can be tremendously helpful to our clients around this. And I don't know that we have to be frightened just because it's it's unusual. Well, and you know, on that note, and this kind of pins up this other huge topic about how we construct mental disorders in a cultural context, but psychosis has a pretty good remission rate in non-Western industrialized countries. Important. Yeah. Very important. So. I think you're right. It sort of depends on how you hold it. Yeah, and there is a way through. Yes. And on to the next. So we're going to switch over and move on to a dream. Our listeners have been kind enough to send us their dreams, and we, we have a dream that was submitted by a listener. This is a female dreamer in her mid-30s. And so I'm going to read the dream here. And as usual, we will leave the dream in the show notes as well. I was walking along a frozen lake near the shore. Suddenly the ice under my feet gave way and I felt myself falling through. My boots were immediately soaked, pulling me under. My coat quickly became too heavy. As my head slipped below the surface, I saw my mother walking some distance from me. She didn't see me. Nobody did. I didn't make a sound. I only had time to think, this is my death, and nobody will see me. I was going down very quickly with no time to even struggle. About 1.5 meters below surface, I had a final quick thought. Maybe I'm dreaming. (laughs) Then I woke up. I'm going to just... Let this sink in. There's such Mm -hmm. an intensity in the images. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about just uh, the dream setting. I was walking along a frozen lake. And I I often think about uh, ice, snow, frozen as frozen affect feeling that has... Is cold. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking too of a great example is that in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, when they go to Narnia, it's winter. And in the Game of Thrones, winter is coming. And these are usually images of things getting solidified and cold. Mm-hmm. And a time of, I mean, in the winter, life sort of uh, looks dead for yes. all intents and purposes. Yes. Life sort of stops. Nothing green, nothing Mm -hmm. growing. Mm -hmm. Things are in stasis. Mm -hmm. So then the ice under her feet gives way and she falls through. And then there's all this vivid imagery of the boots and then the coat and going under. I saw my mother walking some distance from me. 
And this is once she's below the surface of the water, which is interesting. Yes, yeah. once below the surface of the water. Then, then there's this visual imagery of she didn't see me. Nobody did. Nobody saw me. Mm -hmm. I didn't make a sound. I only had time to think this is my death and nobody will see me. Yeah. It, it feels like a real distance of, of not being understood, not no connection, not being seen. Yeah, I mean, of course, the sort of the emotionally, the, the word, yeah, the word that's coming for me is this is well, this is a real image, I think, of depression. Uh, hmm. From the frozen to just going under and feeling like there's nothing you can do, and not being seen, the isolation, I think, that comes with being drawn under yes. into a depression and mm -hmm. being drawn under the surface. Mm -hmm. And water is often an image of the unconscious and depression can be where a lot of affect and energy libido goes into the unconscious mm -hmm. instead of remaining above ground or on the surface in this case of the ice yeah i think that uh, riding on that insight the wisdom in the dream of pulling her from the surface down into the waters down towards the bottom and that in a way her old life is at risk, her old life could pass away, her old way of being mm -hmm. in the world might drown. So it's at the bottom of the ocean, or the bottom or the deep part of the unconscious mind, that she is most likely to find out something new about herself, to find a new attitude in the world, to find a new way to be without the father of her child and in this new life, and that that is frightening, that it feels like it, she's being forced into this state without her permission, mm -hmm. that she's kind of stumbled into this encounter. Yeah, we should just say, I don't think I shared the context of the dream, but the dreamer did provide the following context. I had broken up with my husband, father of my four-year-old, about one and a half years prior to the dream, I was living with my mother. We were in the process of moving into a new house. So it's interesting. Um, it's about 1.5 years prior to the dream, and she falls 1.5 mm -hmm. meters below mm -hmm. the surface. Mm -hmm. So there's something about this mm -hmm. uh, year and a half. Kind of the lowest point. The lowest point. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was living with my mother. Mm -hmm. If I were working with her, I'd want to know what that relationship felt like mm -hmm. with a, a new significant other, another adult in the house of the mother, and what that whether that's a companioning experience for her or not. Yeah, there's something haunting about she's slipping below the surface and she can see her mother, but her mother doesn't see her. I mean, it's... <gasps> You know, it's very sort of intense. breathless. Yeah. And mm -hmm. cannot make a sound. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we And we often use the word see a, as a way of apprehending something. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see your point. Mm -hmm. Oh, I just didn't see that before. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, now I see, you know. Mm -hmm. Feeling not apprehended. Mm -hmm. But it feels like the lysis, which is Jung speak for the end of the dream, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, has a... Uh, a more optimistic note. I had a final quick thought. Maybe I'm dreaming. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Which, you know, both sort of delivers her from the peril. But but also I think kind of it's a, it's a nod to, oh, perhaps this is a psychological experience in a way. That's like one way to maybe yeah. translate it. I, would, uh, I want to go a little bit deeper into some of the symbolism and, and translating that in my own mind into some possible psychological attitudes. So when I think of her psyche being a frozen lake, I think of that as a world that's dominated by the world of the mind, of the intellect. There's a way in which things get very angular, things have become highly structured, that feeling is not as present in the environment. Well, feeling is frozen. Feeling is frozen, and that she is garbed in a way that protects herself. The boots and the coat are a way of being insulated. So there's several mm -hmm. things that happen in the dream. She's walking around feeling sure that the intellectual defense which freezes over the water is really secure and it's not going to be breached mm. because none of us are going to walk across a lake unless somehow we have this idea that the lake is absolutely frozen solid so she's not able to ascertain the fact that she's on thin ice 
<laughs> that the ego's attitude is sure that she can walk across mm -hmm. this lake. That's a good point. And that as the ice gives way, it's the defenses, the boots and the coat, which she uses to defend against her the environment, cold. actually pull her, or down pull her down and into you, this yes. feeling. And you could, yes. And of course, you could also hear the boots and the coat partly, you know, as a defense, but also as persona. And of course, those that can be the same thing, you can use mm -hmm. your persona defensively. And it, it does suddenly in this land, in this world, in this watery world of feeling these heavy defenses, uh, the accoutrements of persona do become a real liability, because they are weighing her down. But as you're saying, it's what pulls her down to perhaps where she needs to be. It That's pulls her into her depths. Mm -hmm. Where the water is water. Mm -hmm. It's not frozen. Mm -hmm. There's it's, plenty mm -hmm. of feeling here. E even though in the comments she says, sad that I was dying, but calm, no fear. Mm -hmm. But it feels in the dream, I think I felt like, oh my God. Oh, that's terrible. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it's sad. The, I hear, but I, something, yeah. there's more affect in this part of the dream just for us reading it and taking in the images than there is of someone walking on the surface of the ice. It evokes a lot of pathos. Yes, Absolutely. It does. But I think that the image there of the mother doesn't see me, nobody will see me, I think that's f deeply poignant relative to the intellectually cold environment in the beginning of the dream. And how many clients have we had who come in in a tremendous intellectual defense, and then we find out that there was a way in which their feeling life wasn't seen, it wasn't mirrored, mm -hmm. it, somehow there wasn't even language offered in the household or in, in the environment mm -hmm. there. So for her to recognize that as she's drowning in feelings, the mother, the internal mother, cannot perceive that. She's saturated in feeling, has no language for it, and that she herself has no language mm -hmm. for this saturation of feeling yeah. that she's drowning in. Yeah, I, I, I like what you're doing there, Joseph, and I, I think you're right. If I had to say what the relationship with the mom is like, and of course we don't know, my, my guess is that that you're on to something there and that, that this, this would have been a kind of mother-child relationship in which mom would have um, perhaps seen and appreciated the daughter's intellectual gifts, but but really not have been able to meet her in a feeling way. Yes. And so that's the objective level. And the subjective level is that she images this as a mother, an internal mother part mm -hmm. of herself, which we can also well imagine with all these frozen, the frozen lake, the ice, and the the heavy outerwear that she has to have as, as her defense. I, I really want to um, mirror what Deb said, because I want to say to any of the readers who submit your dreams, we speak in a very relaxed, kind of thinking out in the open process. The fact is that your mother may actually be a lovely and kind person, and, and we don't know that. So sometimes when we talk about the mother, we are really talking about the mother as it is represented in the dream image. Yes, we are certainly not making assumptions about the character of anybody's yes, we don't mother. Know. Right. I felt that the end of the dream, the, the lysis of, I had a final quick thought. So I'm taking your point, Joseph, about the intellectualization and those defenses. But this thought does come to, in a sense, her, bring something new in. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm dreaming. Then I woke up. So already there's another position in the psyche. Mm -hmm. There's a position of greater consciousness, an observing place that says, whoa, maybe I'm dreaming. Mm -hmm. And then I will wake up. Well, waking up is more consciousness. So it feels as if there is some momentum here in the dreamer. Yeah, it's funny. I understand what you're saying. I have a slightly different feeling about it. I feel like our defenses rouse up when there's a feeling that we've just reached our limit. So whatever was happening in the intensity of the imagery in the dream may have just reached the limit and the ego retreated to its thinking function again. So the thinking function reasserts and says, this is all I can handle. You know, we have to mm -hmm. pull out of this imagery. Sure. 
But it would be interesting, and we'll talk about active imagination in the future, that there is a way of returning to the dream when we feel strong enough and reimagining the dream to see where that might have gone if she didn't feel like she had to quickly ah, get out of it. Of and that's always very on. interesting. Yeah. Dreaming the dream on. And uh, your point's well taken of that this might be as much of a limit as possible. However, in the so-called real world, this dreamer wrote down her dream and sent it to us. Mm -hmm. So there is some kind of reflective process going mm -hmm. on. And courage. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. To, to be comfortable with having three strangers yes. kind of comment on it. Absolutely. Yes. And I admire that very much about all the listeners. Yeah. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.